I'm just going to talk generally about the experience of working with communities. This is partly because in, often I'm speaking with people from cultural institutions or from municipalities or other groups who find the idea of making contact with communities difficult to approach, maybe even intimidating, not quite knowing where to start. So what I'm just going to do is offer some reflections that are not, not as structured or theoretical as earlier um, the earlier talks that I've done, but just to give you some ideas again from the point of view of inspiring some thinking for the conversations that we will have this afternoon. The first thing I want to say is that community is a really precious idea. It being unnecessary to say that, but during the course of my working life, Community, the idea of community has come under um, critique from some theoretical points of view. I would also say it has sometimes been, it has been appropriated politically to, uh, so for example, there is a, a local taxation in the UK called the community charge. Um, because that makes it sound like a nicer thing than the rates, which is what it used to be. So I think it's really important to, to reflect on that and to, to understand the starting point, in my experience, is that community is a really precious asset. Most of us want to live in communities. We, when we, if we understand that as the, the sense of being in a place where we know other people and other people know us. We are part of something uh, larger than ourselves. We are not um, fragmented. This image is from um, the work that National Theatre Wales have been doing in Pembrokeshire, which is the far west of Wales, the southwest of Wales. Um, and uh, these, uh, they have been working for a long time with the community, about four years in different, it's a very dispersed rural area. And this was the culmination, having produced a series of, of um, uh, projects, they, they had anticipated making a live theatre show, but because of the lockdown, it became a film. And this is a projection of the film at St. David's, near St. David's, and I was at one of these events and the, the sense of a community coming together was really important. So this is part of what I want to talk about today is some of the complexities and ambiguities around community. So this is both a community in the sense that everybody there or most of the people there live in West Wales, live in Pembrokeshire, have an identity and, uh, with it. But it's also a community in the sense that an artistic occasion can create a sense of community. It's temporary, but it's important. The community is also quite complex. I took this photograph uh, in um, uh, Mid Wales at the National Eisteddfod. The Eisteddfod is the, is the um, traditional gathering and celebration of Welsh language culture. And uh, nowadays, there are visitors to the Eisteddfod from other parts of the world. And this is um, a group from China. Um, and I think it, it shows some of the uh, complexities of community. Community can sometimes be constricting, can give you a, a sense of that you have to belong. You have to be a certain kind of person. Maybe you even have to wear the same clothes. Um, so this, it's, it, yes, it's, it's precious, it's valuable, but it has some uh, problems. As soon as you define community, you automatically define people who are not part of that community. Because by saying uh, we are a community, you're saying uh, if you don't meet the, the criteria of how we've defined our community, you are not the community. And so that notion of inclusion and exclusion is inseparable and is, again, part of the difficulty, the complexity that comes with community. This is a part of a religious procession in Barcelona that happened, I happened to see. 
Um, community is also, can be a public and a performative thing. So uh, people want to, their sense of community to be recognized and validated by uh, rituals that are used to mark community. So yesterday, Tryan told us about the, the uh, sorry, Sergio told us about the Tryan Square and the, the, the bringing in of a Christmas tree by a local people. They were making a ritual to say, this is our space. It was a very small thing, but it was an important step. Um, but again, part of the ambiguity of this, um, uh, Ed will know this from the experience of Ireland. In Ireland, in the north of Ireland, in Northern Ireland, there are two distinct communities uh, defined by religion, but also by other characteristics. So there is the Republican Catholic community, there is a Protestant Unionist community. And one of the ways in which historically uh, those senses of community have, has been performed in public are, is the lighting of bonfires and public marches to celebrate the uh, Battle of the Boyne, which was when uh, William of Orange uh, defeated uh, the uh, Irish forces and established the Protestant ascendancy. Now we're talking about something that happened 300 years ago, but it's still very vivid and it can be a cause of rioting and conflict. Uh, those, those public celebrations of um, community. So that performative aspect is really important. We, we see a nice parade like this and think that's lovely. Isn't that nice, a community celebrating itself? But these rituals can be used as much to demonstrate to others that they don't belong, that they're not part of, of this. And this is an image, again, a photograph I took from a project I was involved in. I worked with a, these, a group of, of um, people who had a range of health problems. Uh, in, and we did a writing project. It's a small project and it ended up with them reading from their work uh, in public. And they became a community during the 10 weeks I worked with them. They didn't know each other beforehand. They were people with multiple and, and complex uh, needs. Um, some people only came for a bit, some people stayed, some people dropped out and came back. But what I loved about this picture and what I want to show you is uh, the woman in the, the purple dress at the center is holding the arm of the person next to her, reassuring her, saying you can do this because there was, they were aware of each other's vulnerability and that sense that community can be strengthening and can be a, a space of care is really uh, important. So all of these are just to highlight this sense. And I've, during the yesterday and today, I've been conscious that I'm hearing Often people talk about the community. And what I really want to talk about today is communities. That there is not a community. There is never a community. There are complex overlapping communities. Um, and these are some of them. Uh, one of the ways in which communities exist are communities of place. This is my village in France. Um, on the 14th of July. Um, so it's a very nice, friendly uh, moment. Uh, there's a firework display and everybody comes down to the village. It's a very, it's a rural area, it's a dispersed village. We have more than 40 settlements uh, across the mountains. Everybody comes into the main uh, village and enjoys the, so it's the simplest, easiest idea of what is a community, people who live in a place. But here's a different kind of community. This, this also was from the, uh, a group at the Eisted Fod. Um, communities of interest, people who share a common interest. And I like this because uh, there, is a, a, there are layers of interest here. There is Hong Kong, there is Welsh, and there is 
choral singing, male choral singing. And some of these people are pro probably have Welsh ancestors, others don't. Uh, visibly, they are Hong Kong people. So there are, but there are people who are united in a love of a particular tradition of singing, and also the culture that clusters around that kind of singing. Demographic communities. This is a, a group called the Lawn Mowers, um, who are, and they describe themselves as an independent theatre company. They are people with learning difficulties. Um, and uh, I took this photograph. I had, I've worked with this group for a number of years, and most recently we made a film together. They make film. Um, they wrote it and performed it, and the film is about growing older as a person with learning difficulties, because already that is a new experience, because the life expectancy of people with learning difficulties uh, has historically been low. Now people are living longer, and so they're confronting new experiences. Um, and uh, this, The Lawn Mowers, is a fantastic uh, theatre and arts organisation. It has about 100 regular members who come every week, and they, they do nightclubs, and they do theatre productions, and they now do a lot of training for healthcare workers to learn how to, to uh, care for people with learning difficulties. So this is a community that is uh, linked by the fact that they have uh, the, the same disability, the same experience or common uh, disability. Uh, it's the communities of culture. Uh, this is a choir and young people's choir that I met in Barcelona. Um, who are part of the opera project, the, the Spanish version of the opera, the Spanish branch of the opera project that you heard about this morning from James. Um, these are young Filip people of Filipino heritage living in Barcelona, and they're a choir and they um, will be part of the opera. But so to me, I knew nothing. I didn't know that uh, in Barcelona there would be so many people of Filipino heritage who were maintaining their traditions and, and their culture. And uh, it's true of many others. I could show you en endless examples of this. So people linked by a common culture and heritage. And finally, communities of experience. This is a, a, a performance, which I'll talk to you again about at the end of the day, as I promised. This is one of the two uh, projects which I think are interesting to, to compare. This is a performance called This Is Not For You by a, a theatre company, a disabled-led theatre company, deaf and disabled-led theatre company called Grey Eye, founded about 40 years ago. This particular performance was uh, made by and with 25 disabled ex-servicemen. And it is about their common experience of having been injured and permanently disabled through their service in the military and what that has meant for them in their life afterwards. So uh, again, you can see all of the, the, the people in black t-shirts that you can see in the center of that uh, of, of that arena, they are part of those, they are among those 25 um, uh, people, um, all sharing a common experience, in a sense, not of disability, that's, that's the surface. The common experience is of trying to reintegrate as an injured service person into civilian society. And that's what the, the play the, that they made was about, and I'll tell you more about that later. So you can see already at least five different ways of imagining community, five different ways in which people come together and feel the sense of community, the sense of belonging, of being together. Other things I want to say about community uh, is that it can be temporary and provisional. It's not, you're not either something that where you belong to or don't belong. The uh, ex-service men and women in the previous thing, for, they worked on that project for three years. It was very difficult. It took them enormous amounts. Some of them, uh, 
uh, made enormous sacrifices to be part of that project. But that community will dissipate after the project. It no longer exists. Some of the people are in touch with each other, but others not. This is the most temporary community. This is a, a storyteller speaking to um, uh, visitors at a chateau in France um, last year. And it's a, 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 a community that is formed for an afternoon of people being part of something, not knowing each other, strangers. They're sharing a common experience in this artistic moment, but then it will, it will go. And when I say provisional, I also mean that we are all, uh, we all have autonomy in the world to a greater or lesser degree. We make choices. People don't all choose to belong to the same extent. Some people will say, okay, I, I'm part of this, but I'm going to stand further on the edge than you, metaphorically, sometimes literally. Um, so people's uh, willingness to be part of the community may, may be uh, provisional or contingent. And communities can be fluid. This is uh, the performance ensemble another group with whom I've worked in Leeds. Um, they, this was their big theatre production last year. The performance ensemble is, is uh, a group of professional and non-professional actors, performers who share the experience of being uh, more than 60 or broadly post-retirement. And uh, they the members of that community changes depending on uh, circumstances and also unfortunately because some members have died over the years and the so this it is a it is a fluid group and people who belong to this group have a strong identity there's a strong community there but they also belong to other communities so there are chinese members there are uh, black members. There are people from different parts of the city. There are people who belong to, to different, who would identify with different social groups and so on. So communities are many things. And this is, this is the group photograph we did with the, 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 um, the group who uh, I showed you before with when they were performing their writing. In this group, you have uh, countries. Uh, there are people with different mental and physical um, health problems. Uh, there are uh, people of different sexualities and, and genders and uh, um, all sorts of other ways of imagining community. But what I liked about this photo particularly and what I want to show you is that uh, I think it's the smile that they have, the laughter that they're sharing at this moment that shows you there is a sense of community there. There is a, and, and that is something that has come out of the 10 weeks that, that we work together, uh, working on Tuesday afternoons once a week. It's a small thing, but I know that for them, for that moment, it was, it was precious. And that's what um, all of this is about. So, um, to try and, and and draw some some conclusions or not conclusions so much as some some suggestions out of this. The first thing I want to say is that given what I've tried to to suggest about the complexity, um, we really don't have any knowledge or expertise about other communities. This photograph, um, I, I I would put money on it. None of you could tell me what accurately what is happening in this photograph because you cannot know um, it was actually taken uh, on the beach in Mogadishu uh, in, and is uh, uh, a photograph about, uh, around um, displaced people an exhibition of this made by and about displaced people from within Somalia and uh, rebuilding connections be between uh, communities. Now, of course, it's not a trick question. I'm not, not saying but, uh, that you should know any of these things. I'm simply saying to highlight how careful we should be. Even in our own towns and cities, we, we go and we look at places and we think we understand 
but actually we may not understand at all. I am very conscious that my experience as a white, middle-class, educated, straight man of walking the streets of European cities has always been different from the experience of people who don't share those relatively privileged uh, social characteristics. And consequently, what I look at, how I see things, is a poor guide to how other people might see things. So I have to uh, uh, approach all communities with humility. And the starting point for that, for me, is to recognize listening as an active skill. If I go in knowing that I know nothing, and that's the reason when I talked to you yesterday about the Living Heritage Project, the reason that I was able to do, I think, some useful work in uh, countries and cultures and places of which I had no knowledge at the beginning and with people uh, whose language, uh, where we didn't have a common language, is because I had enough experience and common sense to understand that I knew nothing. I couldn't go there and say, I can tell you what you should do. I had, and that's where the principles came in. I could only say my experience of other places and looking at other projects is that these are the characteristics of projects that work. Now, that's the best I can offer you. You have to think about what your situation is, what your interests are, what your vision is, and work out for yourself, but these ideas might help you work those things out for yourself. So listening, I say it's an active skill. It, it seems very passive, but it's really tiring. It takes a lot of energy. We, most of the time we think we're listening and we're not. We're just sitting there. Stuff is washing over us. It's actually about the skills of empathy, it's about imagination. It's a creative thing. When somebody is telling you something, you're looking for connections. You're looking for, uh, yes, what they're telling you, but also what are they not telling you? What are they missing out? What are they hinting at? So you have to be really good at, at learning how to listen to people. This is this. I added this um, for after the conversation with with um, Alexandra yesterday. Um, this was something I learned from um, uh, an architect called Nabil Hamdi. He's a very interesting man. Um, he's originally uh, an Afghan. Uh, he was born in Afghanistan. Came many years ago uh, to to Britain and was. He's now retired, I think, but he was professor of architecture. And planning at Oxford Brookes University. And a lot of his work, I mean, has, has been in the developing world. Uh, it's been, uh, one of his, his books is called Small Change, because he, he's, his idea is, is often that a very small change in a place, that, you know, when, when people come from the developed world to the developing world, they build dams. They build roads, they build great things. And often those things don't make any sense to the local people. And they don't work because they, they are precisely that coming in from an outside and not understanding community. And Abil says, often it's moving the bus stop that makes a difference to whether a, a neighborhood is working or not. And one of the things that he uh, has described in his books, and this is one of his books, The Placemaker's Guide, um, is what he calls transect walks. Asking somebody, asking the, the, the uh, people of a community to uh, take you through for a walk through that community and talk to you about it. And suddenly you're being pointed out all the things that you don't know. They, they say, um, uh, this is where the guys sell drugs, you know, or this is where the, the, the kids play. Um, but if if you happen to be there in school time, you won't know that that's where the kids play. And you won't know it's where the kids play because it doesn't look like a playground. It looks like a bit of wasteland, which is where the kids play. 
And it's only by understanding that that you start to uh, understand not what a place looks like, but how it's used, how people actually live in it. Why do people not stand at the bus stop? Because that's where the, the, the rubbish is tipped, behind the bus stop, and it stinks, you know? So actually, they go and stand somewhere else. Um, so those kinds of things, and, the, and what we talked about yesterday, of asking people what they like about their community, what they're proud of, what are the best bits of it, we so often go in and ask people to tell us about the problems. Um, so I uh, just added that as, as one of, there are lots and lots of practical ways in which you can begin to, to talk to communities. Um, very often the, uh, uh, in, in, in my work, I've often gone to places where, where people gather or to associations. So you can go to the local sports club, you can go to the hairdressers, go and get your hair cut and talk to, to the people in the hairdressers about the place and say you're interested in, you know. Uh, they're one of, the, one of the nicest, this is an old story from a long time ago, but it was a group called Amber Collective. They still exist in the northeast of England. Um, and uh, one of the things they did in the 1970s was take on a pub and run it themselves. They'd never run a pub before, but they wanted to make a film about that community. And so uh, doing that was their way of doing it. And they also tried to, to um, uh, 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 buy a, um, a fishing boat as a way to, to uh, work to learn about the fishing community. These are perhaps more ambitious ideas than you might uh, be able to take. I also wanted to show this, this group, another group from Barcelona, Barcelona a couple of artists who both uh, are called Mireia, and so they call themselves the Mireias. And uh, they have done a, a lot of very interesting things. And I want to show you this because, to show you what's possible, because to be honest, when they talked to me about this, I could only think, oh my God, this is terrifying. They, they, did, they did interventions inviting people to talk about their sexuality in the public space. So um, uh, you can see from this, it's not very good, this is just a screenshot from their website. Um, but uh, you can see that people are writing uh, on, on the paper and the little dots are about um, uh, uh, um, uh, parts of the body that, that are sensitive to different people and so on. And I was honestly astonished that anyone would have the courage to go into a public space and say, talk to, to, to strangers and say, tell me about your sexuality. But they did it and it was beautiful. And, it, and so I'm showing it to you here to show the courage that people can have and the possibility uh, of this. And crucially, I think it's all the reason this works. And I'll tell you another story from, from our, the neighborhood I used to live in, in in the UK. For many years, my wife and some other artists in the, in the neighborhood, they started a, an open studios weekend because there were several artists living there. And then they invited other artists to come and show. And it was a perfectly ordinary neighborhood. And, uh, some of the art was quite um, unexpected, um, indeed uh, uh, provocative to some extent. Um, the, the rule that they made was two, uh, one weekend, two days, uh, was open from 12 o'clock until six o'clock each day. And over the two weekends, two to 3,000 people would come and wander around the neighborhood and visit people's houses and studios and the community spaces where things were, were happening. And there would typically be about 30 artists showing their work. The one really interesting rule that they made was the artist always had to be with their work, which meant that if the work was strange or, uh, you know, you, it seemed confrontational, you could talk to the person about it. You could see that the person had made it and you could have a conversation. They weren't laughing at you. They weren't trying to do something that would make you feel stupid. They were there, happy to talk to you about it. And that 
was for me a really valuable lesson. Just this, um, uh, the, the willingness that people had to talk to the artists and to learn and to have a conversation and crucially to overcome the idea that somehow with this contemporary art, it was not for me, you know, because the artist was, was there and he or she could show you why it was for you. Um, and the, the big test of that was when one year they did a, a series of um, film screenings in the Scout Hut. Uh, and one of the films, quite a funny film, called Ten Naked Men. And the title of the film sums it up. And they were able to show a film about ten naked men in a perfectly ordinary local neighborhood. And nobody mind, there was not a single complaint. So that's all to do with this notion of treating people as with, with genuine respect, as if you really want to talk to them and you really expect them to want to talk to you. It's not, it's a real thing. And that brings me to the, this key thing. We talked about this bit uh, in the group upstairs before lunch. The heart of working with communities is trust. Relationships, good relationships depend on trust. We don't want relationships with people we don't trust. And if we do trust people, then, and they tell us, you'll enjoy a film called 10 Naked Men, we're willing to trust them and sit down and watch a film like that, that we might not otherwise go to watch. And trust is really difficult because on the one hand, it's difficult because it takes time and you can only earn it. One of, the, one of the things, one of the mistakes some institutions and municipalities and um, cultural organizations make is they expect trust. They have a, a, an idea of themselves as being, I have good intentions. I am a good institution, a good organization. Of course, you should trust me. But they fail to understand that for the other person, there's no reason they should trust you. You're, you're big, you're powerful, you've got all the money, you, you do things that are clever. Why, you know, why on earth should I trust you? So it takes time, but the good thing about it is that you can earn it. You can always earn trust. What I mean by that is it's in your control. You earn trust by how you behave. If you behave honorably, decently, reliably, with respect to other people, slowly, they will, you will earn their trust. And if you, I, I don't know if you, any of you know, uh, the book by, called The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. It's a lovely book. It's a wonderful, my favorite bit in that book is when uh, the little prince meets the fox and he has to learn how to get the fox to trust him and the fox teaches him he says you have to turn up at the same time every day and just sit there and i'll start expecting you to turn up at the same time every day and then i'll start looking forward to you turning up and slowly we'll build trust these are very simple human lessons but somehow whilst we may be good at doing them in our personal lives organizationally other factors uh come in and we forget that these are the ways we should we need to operate and that's why i say it takes a minute to lose trust tomorrow i will talk a bit about evaluation and one of the complexities of evaluation is when do you assess whether a project has been successful or not typically evaluations happen soon after the project is finished so there's a lovely buzz in the air. There's been a performance. There's been an opening. There's been an exhibition. Everybody's feeling great. It's all been a success. But if you go back six months later or a year later, you suddenly find that it's like a balloon that all the air has gone out because the people who did the project have gone. And they led people to trust them and to think that they were interested in that community. But actually, they weren't. They were interested in the project. And now they're interested in a new project in another community. The end result is that the trust is gone and the, the community has been left sometimes in a worse place 
than if nothing had ever happened because the community has just been had its suspicions confirmed about outsiders it's had its cynicism confirmed you know they don't care about us really they just want to come here when they want to and then they they go away they make promises and it's all air and as i said to the to the group upstairs this morning i think it doesn't matter what promises you make. What matters is that you keep the promises you make. So you can say, I'm only here for this weekend. I'm only here for the summer. I'm going to do this project and this is what it is. If that's a promise you make, that's a promise you keep and you won't let anyone down. But if you actually only intend to be there for the summer or you're going to be there for the summer because you've got the funding, and maybe you'll try and come back and you'll try and get some more funding, but actually it never materializes. That's when you let people down because you've led to expectation, you've given expectations that you can't fulfill. So never make promises unless you know that you can make them, that you can deliver them. Um, and the last thing uh, I'll say now is just a, a final thought. This is a... I just included this picture because it's a nice image of people working together and also because Ed is in it. If you look carefully, you'll see his, him head down working at the table. This was at Cork Community Art Link in Ireland a few years ago. Um, and uh, uh, this is just, uh, you can't see the, the, um, the, the message for some reason, it's too high. Okay, I'll tell you what it says. Um, one of the things that I have learned over the years, and it's part of the listening thing, as part of the trusting and earning trust, is that sometimes the most empowering thing you can do is to ask for help, to say that you don't know the answer, that you're stuck, that you have a problem. I don't mean to, to, that you do that when it's not true, but it should be true because none of us are, are uh, Superman, you know, or Superwoman. We can't always know what the answers are. And particularly when you're working in someone else's community, on someone else's agenda, you're not going to know. And so you should have the courage to say, okay, we have a problem here and I don't know what we should do. What do you think? Help me. It's one of the most respectful things you can do to say to somebody else, I think you can solve this problem because I can't. I think you may have the, the solution. And then you empower someone. The, the mistake that we often make, and I've often made it in the past in, in, as a community artist, is that I'm the person who feels they have responsibility for this project. I feel that today. I feel I have responsibility for this capacity building session because I'm here, I'm being paid to be here. I've organized it. I've promised you that you're going to learn something out of it, that it's going to be worth your time. And so I have this enormous sense of obligation that I have to know the solutions. And when I'm working with communities, it's the same thing. You feel that you should be the one that, that is always able to, to, to solve the problem. And sometimes you need to have the humility to say, I don't know, I don't know, what do you think? The final element of this, and the reason why I like this image, is because why I began by saying communities are valuable, they're precious, they're important, why? because we are always stronger when we're together, when we're working together. And that is, more, that is most true of the most vulnerable, the most disadvantaged. We live in a, in a, a world, particularly in the last uh, 40 years with the, the rise of an individualistic consumer oriented type of society. We live in a world where some people are empowered and have opportunities 
And many don't. Many are not empowered and don't have opportunities. They are left behind. Um, I'll tell you one last story. Uh, this was something I learned a long time ago. The, it concerns a, a, pub, uh, a social housing provider, a very big social housing provider in the, in the, the UK. It had uh, one, uh, they had uh, a lot of different uh, large estates, blocks of flats. And there was one where they tried something where they, they had a lot of problems with young people. And they, they couldn't solve the, the problem. And then the first thing was they, they recognized, they did an imaginative leap and they saw the young people as their tenants as well. The young people were not only the problem, the source of the antisocial behavior that the adults complained about, they were also tenants. So they started putting in place artistic programs for those young people that became more and more ambitious and they were very successful. But after a period of years, what they realized was that the young people were leaving the estate. And the net result of their work over a period of 10 years was in effect to leave the original community with fewer of its energetic, capable, creative young people than at the beginning. Now, the answer to that was obviously not to say we shouldn't give young people an opportunity to, to grow and to move on and, and to develop their, their situation. But it was to do that, but also to remember the people who are left behind, the people who will never uh, want to work or, or be able to work or have the talent to work in the creative industries or whatever it, it may be. And their, their strength has always been collective strength. It is in helping in community development and helping people to organize and work together that the people who are most vulnerable are able to, to, to um, achieve what they want. So if you remember back to the group that I showed you the photograph of, the lawnmowers, a group of people with learning difficulties, they have been working now for over 30 years and they have secured funding and they have secured good uh, lives and training opportunities and all kinds of, of openings for their members. And they've done that by working together and by uh, taking on sometimes the, the public authorities that are supposed to provide them with services. So that in the end is the, the real, for me, the real purpose uh, of, of this and why I, I describe my, the work that I uh, do and am and, and concerned with as community art, because it is about building community, helping people to come together and build the skills where together by pooling their different skills and abilities from the professionals and the non-professionals, but also all the different characteristics that make up the complexity of those communities, then we end up with uh, processes that leave communities stronger rather than uh, disempowered. Thank you very much. Sorry, it, I, I think it, it, it says what I, what I told you, which is, it, it, says, um, it says, ask for help. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help because it's a, um, a good way of empowering others. I started working in the museum sector in my late 20s, which means I've been working the sector for about 17 years now. And as well as work in the museum sector, I then went on to work in Heritage, an organisation, a charity called National Trust. And then now we're at the kind of uh, stop where I work at Creative Blackley. And part of my own development are just to enhance my own understanding and learning. I've started to join various sorts of boards and, and charities, which are quite different to my sector. So, for example, I work with Central and Eastern European Arts Organisation. So I sit on their advisory board. I also sit on a local business that's called Paycare as well. And I kind of get an understanding of various sorts of things and understand the landscape better. 
I'm a second generation South Asian Pakistani, born in the UK in Birmingham, and I'm also a twin as well. So the creative black country, as Francois mentioned, it is a, a programme rooted in local communities and it is part of Arts Council's initiative called Creative People and Places. And we are one of those 33 programmes across the UK where Arts Council consider where people are least engaged in the arts. And we work in a place called the Black Country, which is an area of the West Midlands that has a population of more than a million covering four metropolitan boroughs. And we are a small team of five members of staff and we are supported very fortunately by a fantastic family of freelancers. The phrase black country comes from what Francois referenced about the, the industrialization. It comes from the soot from the heavy industries covered the area. And it is one of the most industrialized parts of the UK. Um, the accountable body who we, um, we are part of is a unique group of organizations that we call a consortia. Um, and there are seven partners within this. Um, there are three um, arts organizations and the four voluntary councils. And collectively, they are um, rooted in community engagement and have an amazing track record of working with local communities, hence why we, um, we really value their inputs, their expertise, their connections. They almost act like a corridor of um, giving us access to thousands of community groups, which we wouldn't have been able to, um, to make um, a start with had we um, had these partnerships not been in place. So if I was to describe Creative Black Country, we came on board, we started in 2014, um, and we are many, many things. We do consider ourselves as a catalyst, a broker, a facilitator, um, and a, a type of program that develops a program of work which is relevant to our local residents and reflects the local makeup of our communities. And like I said, Creative Black Country is many things to many people. It's, it's a partnership working on a local, regional, national and international level, working with local people, writers, artists, scientists, businesses and discovering um, and working with experts in the area. And it gives us a chance to have exciting collaborations, an opportunity to make arts and culture more visible, making more of what's already happening with it, whether it's skills, people, parts, heritage, languages, communities or stories. We see it as amplifying what's already happening in our local spaces and places. So with that comes many expectations. So early on, when we started as a programme, we worked with Francois to help us try and mould or try and communicate what we actually are. Um, and collectively, we came up with a term, making the most of. So hence why I've listed all those words and kind of hoping you to give you a flavour of what we make the most of. And that's what's helped us to um, talk to people and make it relevant to local people. Um, but ultimately, it is our aim is to work with local people to make more of what's happening. And I'd like to share two stories about this um, in, in the way that, that we work. So the first one is a uh, personal favourite. This is, um, uh, it's, a, it's a story about, <clears throat> story about migration, survival, love and food. And if you go on our website, you will be able to see and have a look at what uh, a bit more about this and pubs because it is a phenomenon in the black country. And in the black country, there has been a quiet revolution um, called the Desi pubs, which actually means authentic. Um, so Desi is the Asian word and it means authentic. Um, and if you ever have the opportunity to come and visit us um, in the in the black country and you pop into a desi pub you'll be you'll have a really warm welcome you'll be welcomed by lovely smells in one pub you might find it's um quite um quite homely and another one you might find it's quite uh, it's like an area we'll find some books that looks like a mini library so the pubs the desi pubs have got a really really 
unique flavor. But what was really exciting about this is you wouldn't necessarily put arts and landlords together with um, um, in an arts program, but it was a slow burn and slowly a, a project program started to come through. So what it, um, <clears throat> so the landlords helped to define what kind of artworks would be placed in the pubs. And alongside this, they, the landlords helped us to talk to the regular pub goers and also connected us with the Midlands Pub Association as well. So this all helped. It was a slow kind of burn over two years to get to this place where the stained glass window is permanently um, um, staying at the, the Red Cow in, in Smedic. Um, and we didn't decide on any of Creative Black Country didn't make any decisions on which artworks would, would go into the pubs. I think what's really amazing is that relationship and those friendships were made because of the time that was spent getting to know the pub goers and the landlords. We simply provided a space for landlords to come together. And it wasn't, it wasn't, um, you know, it didn't, I mean, it, it didn't happen overnight. It really was going along to the pubs, um, making sure that, you know, the landlords were comfortable. And then, you know, the end, near the end point when we had the panel who would look through the artist commissions, um, the designs that came forward to have an art gallery, the landlords and Creative Black Country in the room was quite, um, quite a moment for us. And they actually, the landlords financially uh, invested in this as well. So it was quite a balanced relationship as well. It wasn't a, like a parent or child relationship. It felt very equal as well. So <clears throat> the whole process of just making sure that CBC facilitated, it was really, really critical and keeping the landlords um, and the Midlands Pub Association um, together was really good. Um, and to this day, you know, this was, um, this was, back in around 2018 or so, um, but the friendship started to emerge um, around 2015, 16, and to this day, we still have connectivity. And I think that's quite a sign of um, um, creating sustainability and keeping the programme alive because lots of offshoots come through that. So the, the second um, case study that I'd like to um, share with you Creative Communities um, is a strand of work which is the backbone of Creative Black Country. And it's where we encourage people to have a go, go and see a show, you know, maybe um, bring in an artist to do um, a knitting project. It's something quite, quite simple for somebody to be encouraged to do something creative. Um, and alongside, this is only possible with the, with the support of our place-based creative advisors. So in the four areas, we have a, an advisor, a creative advisor, who is who um, is dedicated to each of the four areas, and they're our ears to the ground. They help us to build networks and relationships, and they work in places like towns, housing estates, self-organized groups, um, <clears throat> and their role is really, really varied. One day could be sharing details of how to access a phot photographer. Another day, there might be in a council meeting talking about how to have a strategic um, uh, influence uh, with, with culture. Um, but the one that really took us by surprise was um, the one based in Dudley. Laura is the creative advisor based in Dudley, and she set up and struck up a relationship with a job centre um, in Dudley. And this, this, this started as um, Creative Black Country being approached by the job centre and just seeing what could happen, um, what the possibilities are. So the, the chats, the conversations were about how can we collaborate and also how can we get young people, um, how can we support the young people who already use the job centre? And then this, this led to um, building and having creative confidence sessions, um, which would lead to um, young people getting support and advice about the creative industries, looking at how they can create a portfolio, um, just experience building networks. And this, this piece of work had started to develop just before lockdown. So, um, but we, 
but Laura then actually took everything online and that did um, have a slightly lesser impact than we wanted to because of um, people being cut, being able to come together and having the full um, level of support that would have happened had lockdown um, not happened. Um, so, so some of the challenges that Laura spoke to us about was around, it is, prob it is linked to um, lockdown and, and, and being able to bring people together. The capacity of the job centre staff wasn't quite there. And also convincing people about the value of these creative connection sessions as well. So to keep everybody on board, I think is, is one of those challenges that we still, still face in um, convincing people about how important culture is. But on the plus side, you can see um, that for us, it was very much about um, we we were able to have visibility in, in, a, in an area which wasn't there before. Um, and having young people in a Zoom room who kept their cameras off as well, um, it, it gave them a safe space to talk about um, anything. And the how Laura worked at the job center with the Zoom calls is she worked with various sorts of different artists and um, they mentored the young people as well. So it was a really different kind of way of working for us. Um, so that was quite, um, um, quite a unique kind of relationship. And, and more recently, this, I mean, this happened, uh, uh, this uh, piece of work happened over a year ago, but more recently, and again, through the, the connectivity of our creative advisors, they once somebody's done something, they don't sort of let go. They kind of keep their relationships open. So Laura kept in contact with the job centre, and we are expecting another proposal for a different piece of work um, in the next few weeks as well. So it's a really, um, yeah, these conversations carry on and um, and carry on building as well. The other thing to mention about these pieces of work is that we, um, any group who put themselves forward about try, wanted to try something or have a go at something go, or to go and see a show, we offer awards up to a thousand pounds, which um, I've looked up to um, the, it, it's a, I believe it's equivalent to about 6,000 Romanian Lou. Um, and this award helps the groups to, um, you know, to pay towards, um, an artist or travel costs, it can be absolutely anything. And the, the application process, I mean, I, we call it an application process, but it's a proposal at the end of the day to say what they'd like to do. And the, and the creative advisor actually keeps an ear to the ground for these potential proposals. Um, <clears throat> and most of these proposals, um, they are confirmed by CBC and on the whole, that most of them get through. The only reason that they might not get through is there might be a detail missing, or it feels like actually it's not quite hitting the criteria because it's it's backfilling something that is meant to be was you know completely different. Um, you know, if it's not meeting the requirements, then it, it won't get through. But on the whole, ninety nine percent of the proposals get through, and we've seen a lot of magic happen through the creative community strand of work. Um, so these, um, these conversations with the creative advisors um, and the conversation, these are all very, very gentle meetings and conversations. And we have seen over the last seven years that the groups have grown in confidence and their own capacity is growing as well to develop their own events and places where they live. And groups want to do more now um, and develop their own funding applications, which again is part of our legacy and the sustainability as well. So without the drive of these groups and this strand of work, we wouldn't be seeing a Russian speaking Christmas panto um, Christmas event with over 70 families or new recipe cards being designed by young people who use food banks. But by recognizing these everyday creativity, a, cr a program is being co-created by local communities. And that's what's really unique as well. And I think there is so much more for us to do, but I, I feel like uh, for the program, this has been a really um, a valuable um, learning curve for us is that we go with where people are and we go at their pace as well. Um, 
So those are the two um, case studies. I've um, <clears throat> so some of the so over the seven years there are a few kind of common themes that um, that are coming through as as potential learning points as well. There's so much more, but I've tried to condense it down into a few few points about what what is it that comes through and what works for us. Um, the model that we have in place is that it's about people deciding about engaging with culture on their own terms, which is nothing new to, it's nothing new. Um, we are standing on the shoulder of giants. People have been doing work um, in this area for decades. You know, we've got Francois in the room, who's one of those, those giants who, you know, is an inspiration. So the words actually stay the same, but what we've, um, started to question is what is about sharing real power, decision-making, authenticity, who actually decide um, what happens and can we really change as well? And we keep uh, working towards this model and those lessons that we, um, um, the lessons that are coming through is about when somebody has like, for example, you know, um, we think in the culture sector that we've got a great idea and we expect people, we expect people to sign up to panels, attend meetings, and you, and you kind of think, well, why? You know, if I was a resident, I think, well, why? Why am I giving up my time? Why should I get involved? So to really engage people authentically, we have to. I've already mentioned this that we have to go to where people are on their terms, have a conversation, and listen. And I do remember um, there's something that still stays in my mind. Um, we have these South Asian um, fun fairs. They're the huge mellas um, that happen every year. And, and a, an outdoor dance performance came and did their performance in the park. It was a beautiful performance. It was with heliosphere um, acrobatics. And I thought we would not have been able to get these thousands and thousands of South Asian people to go to a place that is, is in, in a traditional space. So we have to go to where people are and that still that example still stays with me where people are watching um, the the activity in the local park so yeah it's about building and developing trusted relationships and I've got to tell you a really funny story as well that Francois I uh, you probably you might not remember this but within my first year um, so Francois is our critical friend as well I, I, um, yeah I'm critical friend and he said Sajida what what would you what's the one thing you'd like to kind of achieve by the end of the first year and I thought at the time we you know we are funded by Arts Council we have targets and and I thought mm, we, we need to actually generate more investment more income and he says Sajida the one thing if you can get the trust built um, then we'll be on a really good tangent and that is exactly what has carried us through is building trust um that's in incredibly important. The decision making process um, that we had to think about where does this um, where this sat, um, you know, as a new program, when we first started, it took us time to find our feet um, and work out does the decision making sit with the board, our consortia partnership, does it sit with the directors, does it sit with the team, but over the years we've now got to a place where all the decisions are um, made by mixed panels. So what we do is um, we recruit um, individuals who represent the four areas. And when we have a big, a large scale project and we need to decide how can, which proposals get through. So uh, for an, ex an example, we had a call out for ideas um, linked to um, to lockdown about bringing joy, um, and we had um, a finite amount of um, investment. So we put a call out for ideas, and Creative Black Country. We didn't decide which ideas went forward. We recruited a panel um, that was made up of local organisations and people who already done or been associated with us and done some work with us as well. So that mixed panel. Um, actually is 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 a um, what can I call it it's it's a real eye opener uh, because a lot of the people in the room who make these decisions haven't met each other before and and again sometimes what happens is if a proposal comes to an organization 
they'll go, well, actually, if you're if you're happy with us, we'd like to invest in this activity or can we build it into our own program? So those serendipitous, those fortunate kind of connections um, really are amazing. And some of the previous recipients who've been involved with us as well, they get a better understanding of how we work as well. So that community decision making took us a while, but I think we've got to a place now where we're pretty confident and quite assured and, and we keep and, you know, we never stop learning and never stop changing. So, um, yeah, the community decision making is is um, is um, is now in hand. And then um, we keep making friends as well um, in the sector. You never know when you might need them. We get a lot of um, emails, um, invitations. And and I, and I mentioned this about keeping to making friends because we often get um, asked to collaborate and at the last minute, but you, it makes you question, where's this coming from? Is it a place of, um, we need to just get a funding bid in or actually, is it real? So um, we just really encourage people to um, be open and generous with their connections as well within reason, because as well as um, making friends along the way and being open to, in fact, sorry, I'm going off on a slight tangent now, is when we get, so whilst we as a programme are making lots of these connections, um, we also get last minute, could you put in this bid? Um, and it's actually become easier for us now to pick up the phone to somebody and say, are you happy to be involved? Because we've known this partner or this organisation for some for some time. So um, those, those trust and that building and making friends is incredibly important. Um, and the last one is that there is no template for this work. Um, the work is messy and wonderful. And, you know, we have our integrity and we have our process and guidelines, but things change. Everything has curves and straight lines. Um, but that's the uh, that's the amazing thing to kind of keep going and developing the program and just kind of having peace with the fact that everything might not exactly work out how you planned it. For different personal reasons, there were few young people who started an international art festival and they started to bring a lot of international artists from UK, Italy, France, uh, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Serbia, etc. in this very small village. And it was very interesting interaction with the local people. But the most important thing was that it was not just an art residency in a remote village, but it was a real attempts, real efforts of these artists to understand what is happening and what is important in this village. So they easily find out the goats are more than people in this village and that the goats are part of the cultural heritage of this village, that they're part of the wife. This is probably the most valuable thing the people they have. So it's very interesting for me. It was very interesting and it was interesting for the artists because it's again the same principle of living heritage, Dick, where you stand and trying to understand the uniqueness of the place and trying to understand the unique connection between the people and goats in this small village. So you have one person and you have many goats. That's the situation in this village. And I suppose it's the situation in in other places, in Bulgaria, Romania, and not only. So that's the reason this picture is the cover of my presentation. What I will try to do is to tell you briefly about how the living heritage principles and experience resonated through my professional work in the last 18 years. Sometimes in a very unexpected ways. Sometimes I start com something completely new and then I discover that it's the same approach or the same principles. So in a way, I found uh, my experience uh, with the, the living heritage uh, quite uh, formative for my, for my professional um, development. And uh, I believe that many of these principles are applicable to, to a very different context. So I will try to present you 
different examples. There, uh, these examples are uh, some of many. Yeah, I, I choose few examples, but there are many others that I could present you if I have uh, more time. Um, so, as you will see, uh, it's it's spread over the time. Uh, Ivanovo project, which I know that uh, Francois already mentioned to you, um, the Bellarechka festival, which I've already uh, I've just mentioned, uh, where I did the research, invited by the organizers to try to to research the the the, the impact of the festival over the village uh, in 2007. Uh, then my experience with the International Foundation uh, Reach for Change, uh, uh, which started in 2014, uh, and I for seven years, I was supporting social entrepreneurs in Bulgaria. And I will present you one specific example, uh, which again is, is very close to the living heritage principles, I believe. And then, um, as you know, from, from uh, the end of from December last year, I started, I was invited to be part of the new team of the Ministry of Culture. Currently, I'm a Deputy Minister of Culture. And unfortunately, uh, in most of the time, I, I, all of these principles and approaches is something that is not so visible in my work. But on the other hand, I, I could see how they, how they could be implemented even on, on that level. Because of course the, the administrative work, the policy work and the community work uh, are could be quite different. Um, so I, I will share one example from my recent work. And, and before continuing, uh, as you can see, these are the, this is the slide is copy paste of the Francois presentation from a few days um, uh, ago, so you know the principles. Um, I will not go through them right now. I just wanted to remind these principles before starting. So Ivanovo, um, I, I don't know what exactly Francois presents uh, to you about Ivanovo. Uh, and in fact, I enter in the process uh, later on in 2004, when I started to work with for living heritage in Bulgaria. Uh, the project in Ivanovo were uh, already selected. Uh, the direction of the project was already um, um, made. Uh, and it's, um, uh, it's, it was very interesting for me. I was mo mostly monitoring the project and, and, and evaluating uh, and assisting Francois and, and, and other colleagues to, to see how this project is developing. But what impressed me very much, uh, and when I and then I use this as an example in many many presentation and cases and lectures etc., is the approach on on what is important and what is heritage and who decide and how decided. So as you know, this is a screenshot from the UNESCO page. Um, uh, the Rock Church of Ivanovo are part of the World Heritage List. And of course, um, I, I, uh, the, the, the director of, of the original museum, who is responsible for, for these churches, but also many other things, it's a big museum in the, the city of Ruse. Uh, so he still feel, uh, how to say, a little bit unhappy of the, cho cho uh, the choices that been made during this project many years ago. Because, as you know, the Wako people choose to, to present as their most important heritage, the, the, the old village and uh, the reconstru reconstruction of memories of the old village and not to invest money and efforts in the, the rock churches because they don't feel so much connected with them, even if they're a word in the World Heritage List of UNESCO. So... Uh, out of this example, I always ask myself, who decides what is heritage? Who decides what is important? And, and how to ask about it? Uh, because what I know from the process that the first uh, instinct of the Woko people when they are asked about heritage, about their heritage, was to mention uh, the, the rock churches. But then it was a process to 
to discuss with them and to understand really what is important for, for them, for their even personal memories. So it's, it's, it's a big, big example for me also. Um, and please feel, feel free to interrupt me if you want. I know that we have uh, some time for questions later on, but also if you have some popping up questions, please do it. Then uh, the festival in Bewarechka, the full name is, is Gorna Bewarechka. <laughs> and um, another very important principle of, of, the, of, the, of the living heritage, it's the WACO involvement and the voluntary commitment. And uh, the, the interesting thing is when we talk about the volunteers, we usually used to think about the young people, yeah, teenagers or young people who are helping with, uh, with their hands. Uh, but in Belarichka, the volunteers were the old people because they were mostly old people there. And of course, they are volunteers from abroad who help to do things. But one of the most impressive things um, for me in, in Bewarechka Festival was how the old people was really involved in, in, in reconstructing the heritage and the culture of the village. And it was because the artists really come to them and ask with them to cooperate. They ask them to, to sing songs. They ask them to, to, to tell them about the local traditions. They, they help them with the goats. And then you see that this is, um, they were a real interaction and the real joy in this local people. And that is uh, another important lesson for me. If you can create a joy if you can communicate with the local people, they will support you and, and they will help you because you are doing it for them and, and, and for, for, for the whole community, of course. Um, one other uh, example uh, from, from this, uh, from, or maybe two other accents out of, of the case of Bewarechka. Uh, there, there, there are many, many interesting examples around this festival. But um, beyond the walk of support and the involvement of the walk of people, one of the interesting things was that because of international presence and because of the um, uh, international and media contacts of one of the uh, organizers of this festival, it really became famous in the national media. And, and when uh, something locally became the national news, then of course, uh, the local authorities are highly interested to take part in it. And this, I saw it in, in uh, many cases when we talk about this local community project. If you manage really to involve media, if you manage really to involve the business, if you really manage to involve the local authorities, then it could create sustainability of this project. Uh, and then visibility and, and, and attraction of the national media, not only local media, but also national media is something which is sometimes hard to achieve, but it could be valuable. And, and uh, one example, which I like very much, uh, when I research um, the, the positive impact of, on the festival over the village, uh, one of the examples that the local people told me was about the, the, the trash bins in the, in the trash containers into the village. Because of different kinds of reasons, mostly economical reasons, in the village, usually there is no containers for trash. So what is happening is that the local people throw all of their garbage in, in, the, in the river which is happening in many places around Bulgaria, and I'm sure not only in our region. And then uh, the, the artists which came, they started to, to, to be shocked about this, and they make a campaign uh, to clean the river yeah, and to clean the, the boards of the, the, the river. Um, 
And then they realize that there is a lack of people to do that because there is no system, there is no municipal system which to collect garbage. Uh, and then, of course, they pose this question. And because they are international artists and because there is a media presence, then the mayor of the, the bigger municipalities provides for the days of the festivals uh, containers for trash. And then after the three days or one week festival, uh, then the mayor of the municipality uh, bring back this, uh, take back these containers. So the village was again without containers for, for trash. And uh, of course the local people were not happy and they ask what is happening. So we have these trash containers only for the festival and not, not for the whole year. And why? Because if you are managed to organize these, these containers for, for the festival, then you probably could organize this for the whole year. And of course, that was true. And then the mayor were more or less pressed to do that. So now the village has uh, trash containers uh, for the whole year. Uh, and it was because of the, of the festival. I'm stopping here with this example because we don't have uh, many other, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but um, I'm sure that we have all of these examples around us, which, which present the, 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 the same principles of cooperation, of involvement, of, of um, respect to the local place, and then a cooperation with the different stakeholders around. It's it, what I've learned that this is very, very important. Um, and now for something completely different, as Monty Python used to say, um, Vratsa software is another example. By the way, the, the city of the town of Vratsa is very close to Bevorečka. They both belong to the Northwest of Bulgaria. Uh, which according to the statistic of European Union is the poorest region of European Union um, all around. So there is a lot of uh, un un unemployment, a lot of young people who are so-called uh, needs, not in employment or, or education or training. Uh, and there is a lot of desperate people who, who don't know what to do with their life. And then of course the people are living. Uh, Vratsa Software was the first project which uh, we supported uh, in Bulgaria when we established a special program called Game Changers for support of uh, early stage social entrepreneurs in Bulgaria. Uh, so the idea was um, that there is a, a great idea. There are people who want to change uh, the, the local situation or national situation with an accent on the young people and children. And they need some support, not only financial, but also non-financial support and media support and trainings and mentorship to develop their, their ideas. So Vratsa Software uh, was the first project. I was, I was, uh, um, was head of this program for seven years. Uh, and we supported around 30 projects in Bulgaria. We were very selective, by the way, uh, because each year we received about uh, 300 applications and we selected only five of them. So there is a very uh, long and rigorous uh, process of selection because we wanted to be sure that we invest in projects which will become sustainable. And um, the sustainable economic development is one of the principles of living heritage. It's very hard to achieve it. And we all know that. How to use the local resources in order to make one uh, local initiative sustainable and not dependable from grants, not dependable from subsidies or not only dependable on them. How to generate, generate own, own, own profit or own income, let's say, not profit, but more income. How to, how to develop different sources of funding? Um, how, to, how to make things a sale for reliable? Um, and it is something uh, which is in the core of the concept of the social entrepreneurship. 
Yeah, because what social entrepreneurship say, let's use the, the techniques and let's use the, the, the experience and methods of the business in order to make a social good. And um, Vratsa Software is an example in that respect. So it was a group of uh, first only two young people who decided that they will return in the, their home city of Vratsa and they will make the IT courses for young people. And the idea was very simple. There is a growing hunger in the IT industry for specialists, and I'm sure that this is example in, in many countries, in the region and not only, um, for, for new, new, new specialists, yeah? even the unexperienced young programmers. So um, Emu and Teo, the, the founders of this initiative, they say, why not to do that in this region, in our hometown, where we can train people, and when we can create a Silicon Valley of, uh, of Bulgaria. It sounds funny in the beginning, but just to give you an example, they started in 2014. Uh, currently, they not only trained more than, I think about 200 people as a young programmers, but they, but they also create a company which is safe, sustainable, and which provide work of about uh, 15 people in Vratza. But moreover, there was a three IT companies uh, from Bulgaria which open offices in this city and which gives work for other of their, uh, of, the, of the young people they're trained. So it's, they really started to create a completely new industry in this city, which was with a very high unemployment rate. Uh, but um, I just wanted to, to show you uh, one of the things they are doing. Uh, and, and they're all IT related, of course. Um, but what uh, was interesting for me when I researched their activities, you can see that there is in one corner, it is written treasure hunt. Uh, and I asked them why you are doing this treasure hunt, which is always, by the way, they do it every year. It is always related to, uh, to, to the, the history of the city. Yeah? It, it's some, uh, one of the treasure hunts was somehow related to the Thracian gold found uh, near to the city. Another was for the Second World War and, and bombardment uh, from, from um, uh, American allies in, in Bulgaria. Another is for something different, but uh, it sounds to me like something completely unrelated to the IT issues. And they were very clear uh, that they do this treasure hunt because this is a way to attract new young people in their community. Some young people who are not interested in IT, uh, but who are interested in, in history or in, in this uh, innovative game which is happening in our urban environment. So basically, they were using history and cultural heritage is, as a way to create a community. And then, of course, to use this community for their purposes to attract them to become, to enter in the IT industry. So that was, for me, was was very interesting. On a local level, these connections between economy, IT, culture, everything is, is well connected. Um, and and um, another thing which was very important for me when I started work for this International Foundation Reach for Change, and I will provide later on a link, you can, you can read more about Reach for Change work, it's quite interesting. But I saw that the, the approach of Rich for Change is basically the same approach as the Living Heritage Program. There are two very important things. One is the small grants. And when we talk about the local development, you don't need huge grants. You need usually a small grant is quite enough to start something and then to start to catalyze the process. And the second thing was the capacity building support, which is not one-off. It's not just a training in the beginning, but it's a constant way of supporting your, I would say, investments. Yeah? Because you invest in a project 
you provide a, a small grant, which is very important, which is unrestricted grant. What Rich for Change provide is grants without budget. Yeah. We wanted these people to measure their outcome and their impact, and we don't care to what they spend their money because we believe that they will spend the money in the best possible way to achieve these outcomes. We don't need receipts. We don't need invoices. Um, we, we just need, and we need it, um, to, to see that there is a real development. So unrestricted small grants and uh, capacity building, which is not only uh, training, but they were made coaching and mentorship. And this is exactly what we did in Living Heritage years ago. Sometimes you just need to find the right specialist. It could be a specialist uh, expert in communication. It could be expert in marketing or even in sales in order to help a walker initiative to become sustainable. So um, again, I'm looking at my notes. Um, uh, uh, again, there is many other things which I could say about Rich for Change approach and, and Vratza uh, software. Um, but I will end with again mentioning about these local collaborations. Part of the, uh, of the support of Rich for Change, because we were working together with the biggest national television, was the media support. And again, when you open a small community IT center in a small village, and when there is when there is a national TV cameras, then the mayor is there. You can be sure. And this was uh, this was important again. The, this cooperation between media, local authorities, local business, young people, uh, community organizations. This is for me one of the the receipts of. Of success. And uh, one final example, um, you see that uh, the, this, these examples are quite different in a way. Uh, the, the part of my work is to observe um, the, the, the new European Bauhaus project in Bulgaria. Uh, Ministry of Culture is a national contact point for new European Bauhaus. And um, I'm not sure if you are aware of these new initiatives of the uh, initiative of the European Commission. I'm sure that you are aware because it's widely promoted. Uh, and on the other hand, let's be honest, nobody knows what new European Bauhaus is. <laughs> is it a funding program or it's a, it's a, a, a horizontal initiative? And what is all about? It's a... It's, uh, Honestly thinking, I don't, I don't think that even in the commission, they really know that. I was the moderator of a, a huge international conference of the new European Bauhaus. And after reading stones of the documents, I finally was not sure what it is all about. But what we know it seems important for the commission, it's important for, for the, 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 the head of the commission. And what we also know, that it's trying, this is initiatives that is trying to combine and wants to combine art with environment, with inclusion. And basically it's a very interesting and very powerful idea. Of course, it's, it's, it could be a critic that the new European Bauhaus is a way of, of instrumentalizing culture uh, to, 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 to be used for the, 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 the efforts of the European Green Deal. And this is probably partly true. But what I see from a positive point of view is that this accent on, on uh, inclusiveness and on the importance of, of arts and cultural heritage for the development is something which is... Um, which uh, push the, the 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 politicians and the administrations administration to think in a different way. Uh, and one recent example, I was part uh, in my position of a deputy minister of culture uh, of a working meeting between the European Commission and uh, the Bulgarian representatives from the operational program, uh, the new generation operational programs for um, for regional development. 
And the idea, it was a technical meeting, mostly on expert level. I was there uh, on, on deputy minister level just because I was interested to learn more. Uh, but basically, uh, what I found out that um, the commission is trying to, let's say, to sell to the Bulgarian uh, Ministry of Regional Development, the idea that they have to use the new European Bauhaus concept in their work and to integrate it into the um, new generation program for regional development in Bulgaria. Um, and then the people from the Ministry of Regional Development were quite skeptical. And one of their first arguments was, okay, first, this is something new. We never talk about these things so much. And it's hard to adapt our program. And then what they say uh, was really impressive for me. They have, it is very expensive. It is expensive to be environmental friendly. It is expensive to be sustainable. And it is also expensive to be inclusive. Yeah, they say this participatory approach is very nice, but it is expensive. And they're right. And they're right. All of this, let's say very clearly, also Francois, it is expensive things. The Living Heritage is expensive program. The Rich for Change approach is expensive because when we combine grants with support and when we want to, to, to involve the local people and when we, when we want to, to, to awake the local resources, it is, co it is costly in terms of, of time and money. It is much more uh, cheaper to make the things by yourself and then say goodbye. But if you really want to involve the people and if you really want to make the things sustainable or economic or environmental uh, sense, it's, it's, really, it's really expensive. And then, and then of course the commission tried to explain um, that it is more expensive to be cheap and uh, it, is, it is expensive not to be sustainable. Um, and then I had to leave the meeting because I have another deputy minister uh, meeting. Uh, so I don't know how they continue their uh, conversation. Um, but, but I still keep this question. Can we afford not to be expensive on these things? And um, I will probably stop here. Um, I, I um, hope that this diversity of examples do not confuse the things, but more give you a food for tooth. And I'm finishing with uh, the living heritage principles again, and with some links that I hope it could be uh, useful or interesting for us. And then if you want to just final words, um, if you really want to understand what new European Bauhaus is, um, check the, the prices. Uh, and by the way, the new call for prices, there are only three days or more. So you can apply some of them if you don't did it before. But if you check the prices from the last year, you will see a lot of projects which are basically uh, living heritage projects. So it's interesting to see that. When I originally planned this, it seemed a logical thing to talk about because very often when people are involved in projects that involve the community, there is an expectation from funders and also often an expectation from the people developing the projects that there is an impact and there is a need to demonstrate that impact. I've been working on evaluation of participatory and community art project for many years and my thinking has evolved quite a lot over that time and continues to evolve. So there's a lot that I could say, but I've decided I would try and keep this session quite short and simple and just outline some basic ideas that I hope might be helpful. So let's just begin with the basics. Why do we evaluate? This is very general. So. These are three common reasons for evaluation. First of all, to account for the use of resources. When we get 
if we have a grant or support of some kind, there's often an expectation that that will be evaluated. The second, and I think the better reason, is to learn from and improve practice. When I first started working on evaluation, I remember this arguing to people in the arts world who were not at all familiar with the idea that their work should be evaluated. Evaluation is central to all artistic practice. Artists evaluate all the time. They are making judgments about what they're doing and how close they are getting to what they're trying to do. The big question here is who is involved in that? And the third reason why people often evaluate is to demonstrate the value of arts funding. As I say, in the last 25 years, I've seen a huge growth in the use of evaluation. And I still often am talking with or working with people who I think have a, a misguided belief that somehow if they demonstrate through evaluation that their work is good, all the questions about it will disappear. In my thinking, these things are somewhat different and they're all bound up together in evaluation, but it's helpful to think of them differently. I think the question of accounting for the use of resources is essentially about monitoring. It's about saying, did you spend the, the money that you were given in the way that you said you would do it and so on. Evaluation is, for me, the heart of evaluation is about learning from and improving practice. And that's why it is something that all people involved in creative projects should be committed to doing. The question of demonstrating the value of arts funding, I think is essentially a, a matter of politics because the, it's implicit in the, in the term value. Value is something that people do not agree about. That's why we have politics to try to negotiate and find a, a settlements between our, the different values that we have and the different ways in which we, we set uh, importance on things. So I think the idea that evaluation will somehow miraculously make people who don't think that art is important change their mind is a false expectation and not helpful. If you want to uh, change people's minds about uh, the value of your work, that's a political process that requires advocacy and argument and, and things like that that we'll come back to at the end. Over the period that I have been working and thinking about and writing about evaluation, um, I, it's become clearer and clearer to me that there are some big problems with how evaluation is currently being used specifically in the projects we're talking about in relation to, to projects uh, with communities. The first problem is a is a group of what I might call policy problems. Why do policymakers spend money on uh, projects with the community? <clears throat> As I said to you on the first day, I think the reason we should do that is because it's a human right, it's a human right to participate in the cultural life of the community. So in policy terms, that should be the rationale. And then you can have a, a secondary thinking that says, well, some people don't have, uh, don't participate as much as others. So we need to make, take steps to, to redress that. That also is a legitimate policy uh, rationale. I think what has happened with, as participatory art has become more normal, more common in the last uh, 20 to 30 years, a different rationale has been used, which is somehow that uh, these projects are supposed to deal with social problems. They can't deal with the problems that, are, that are, they are being asked to deal with. So for example, yesterday we heard from uh, James Bingham from Irish National Opera talking about how 
Irish National Opera is working with communities in a logic of a, a bigger project called Traction, <clears throat> which is uh, uh, reaching, aims to reach people at risk of social exclusion. Some of the people in the Irish project are, are at risk of social exclusion, if only by geographical, uh, by where the, the geography of where they live. They are far removed from many of the opportunities that other people have. Participating in an opera project is not going to change that. They will still be living on an island in the Atlantic Ocean. So it's not a, it's not a realistic expectation. And the same is true of many of the projects. The, I think part of the policy problem is people do not ask themselves seriously, is this intervention capable of achieving what the rhetoric around it claims? I think there are very important social outcomes to this work, but they are not the ones that are simplistically um, identified very often. So there is a policy problem there. I would also add there is a, a political problem, um, which is this. This rationale is only applied to projects that involve people who don't already participate in art and culture or public art and culture. That implies that somehow those people are deficient in some ways. They have problems that need solving. Whereas people who go to the opera already or go to museums or go to galleries are somehow simply entitled to have the, the money spent on the things that they like doing without any further re rationale or expectation of a social outcome. And I think that has political and, and moral problems. Then there is a whole raft of problems, ethical problems. As I say, the legitimacy of producing change. If, uh, and I gave the example on the first day, <clears throat> if you get funding to do a theatre programme that is uh, designed to uh, encourage young people back into education who've dropped out, um, on what is the legitimacy of that? step what right do you have to decide to have an impact on other people's lives without their knowledge in uh in therapeutic interventions we have the concept of informed consent the doctor says to you i think you have a cancer you need to have this this operation the doctor's not allowed to do that without you having agreed and understood the risks and so on because there are risks involved in participating in projects which might have a big impact on your life. We don't bring that thinking into this field and that I think raises ethical problems. <clears throat> then there are what I would call practice problems, problems that arise from the, the uh, activity of evaluation. I, uh, recently did some creative writing workshops. Uh, I was commissioned by an organization that asked me to do them. That organization had an obligation to evaluate the work for the organization that provided the funding. They had commissioned somebody to do the evaluation. And the process that had been put in place was at the end of every two hour writing workshop, the people in the writing workshop had to fill out a questionnaire about the last two hours and how they felt about it. It was incredibly intrusive and patronizing. It was saying in effect to people, you're not allowed to be here and have enjoy this activity unless you, uh, provide us some answers. And of course, the people know exactly what answers are the ones that are sought. They're all the ones that say, yes, I was very happy, it's a very good workshop and all the rest of it. So <clears throat> there is, but more importantly, from my point of view, what, it, what this is doing is introducing a level of self-consciousness to people who are participating in, a, in an activity, which is unjustified. 
When you go to the theater, when you go to a gallery, when you go to the cinema, when you read a book, there isn't somebody tapping on your shoulder every five minutes saying, okay, stop now, tell me how, you're, how you feel about this. But that's what we do to people that we invite to participate in, in projects. And finally, there are evaluation problems. There, there are, I mean, all of these headings summarize more complex uh, things that I have time to deal with now. But I'll just talk about one evaluation problem. Evaluation, at the heart of it, depends on trying to establish a causal link, a connection between what happened and what the result was. So if what happened was these young people participated in the theatre project and some of them went back to school after having dropped out, can I establish a causal link that says they went back to school because they took part in the theatre project or actually maybe it's because their parents uh, put pressure on them and or they, they're the problems in their emotional lives had got solved and they were happier and they, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why things might happen. The heart of evaluation, you're trying to, to be able to, to show with some confidence that the activity resulted in the outcome that you identify. The problem with applying this thinking to the arts <clears throat> is that the arts are always a dialogue. So uh, if I paint a picture, I try to express what I think in this picture, and then you look at it, what you make of the picture I have painted is not in my control. And all of you are likely to make something different of it because you are bringing yourselves, your own experience, your own uh, uh, judgment, your own taste, your own character. It's why you can take two teenagers to the theatre for the first time, and one of them will come out very excited and say, I want to, I want to do theatre now, and the other one will come out and say, if you ever inflict three hours of boredom so terrible on me again, I will never speak to you. It's because we, we bring ourselves, you know, whether you have a good night at the cinema may depend on whether you ate before you went in, whether you, you're having uh, problems with your partner, whether you're uh, in a happy mood, just as much as whether the film is any good. So, but this logic is somehow that people are blank. The people we work with are blank and everything that I've been saying to you over the last three days is the opposite of that. They are not blank, they are exactly like me. They have character, they have culture, they have identity, they have desires, they have problems, they have all of those things. And so if I do a project, I am not simply operating on a, on a blank sheet of paper that then will take the imprint of whatever I have done. It's always an interaction. So the the causal connection is really hard to establish, to be able to say that this happened because of what the project I did. In terms of, of where this leaves me in terms of practice, what it, it's part, again, it's one of the things that I've said to you already. I think the work that I'm doing, the work that I, I believe in, it does produce social outcomes, but it produces social outcomes by creating opportunities for people to find what they want in that opportunity, not something I intend them to find, right? That's the core difference. I create, a, if I create a creative writing workshop. I'm not trying to make anybody be a writer or make anybody more confident or make any, build anybody's social networks or give them new skills. If I had an intention for what you would get out of these three days, I would fail. It's not possible. So the best I can, I, can, I can do is to hope that you will find something. And in a session we did just before lunch, what we heard was all the different things that these three days have meant to you because you have taken out of it the things that you were looking for, 
not anything that I thought you should take out of it. So some possible responses to these things. The first is to be clear about your aims. And that this takes you back to what I was saying before, the intentions uh, of the broad intentions of work, it, whether the logic you're working in is cultural democracy, cultural democratization, or social change, but at least to be, to be clear about what it is you're trying to do and not fall into the trap of saying one thing to your funder and another thing to the people you're working with and perhaps a third thing to your partner. And that helps if you are transparent about the process. If you're always saying the same things to people, of course you will use different words, different language if you're talking to the municipality than if you're talking to a 15 year old uh, uh, kid in a neighborhood. But you're still able to say, this is what I'm doing, this is why I'm doing it. You know, the, the language may change, but you are transparent about what the process is. And you are honest about the results. Honesty about results means you also report the things that didn't work, not only the things that did. That also means that you're not just reporting those things, you're looking for the things that didn't work. I am often more interested, um, Vita told me this morning, I was too self-critical because we we're talking about this, this workshop. Uh, she may be right, I don't know. But what I'm interested in, what I focus on is what's not working because that's something I can do something about. I'm not focused on what is working. That will take care of itself. Um, <clears throat> so, some simple guidelines. I think evaluation should be, first of all, it should be minimal. Only do what's necessary. There's a beautiful story by George Luis Borges, the Argentinian writer. Um, it's a very, very, very short story, and he talks about um, an ancient civilization that was obsessed with cartography, with map making, and they developed the art of map making ever uh, to ever higher levels of of um, uh, sophistication and quality until they finally made a one to one scale map of their country. And it, it's, the story finishes with saying, and now on the tops of mountains, you can still see fragments of map, you know. It is possible to know everything if you are willing to pay everything, yeah? There is a balance between all of these things, between what interferes with what you're doing, between the cost it takes you to, to know it in time and resources, and the value of what you get from knowing it. So just try to keep your evaluation to what is really necessary, what you can use and what will help you. Secondly, try to make it discreet so that yes, it has to happen. You're honest that it's a, a process that, that needs to happen, but it's not interfering in the way that I said, okay, we've just done a workshop right now. How come the evaluation forms will need to, to fill in? Try to keep it simple so that everyone can understand it. This is very difficult to do um, because it requires some skill and training and uh, in how to do evaluation. For example, <clears throat> it's not only simple about knowing what you're trying to know and when you need to try to know it and whose job it is to gather that information, but it's also things that are I suppose quite technical, like how do you ask a question? If you have a questionnaire or you're gonna ask somebody a, a question in an interview, how do you frame that question? How do you avoid it being a leading question so that they know what you what answer will please you or will not please you? Another thing that I find people often do is actually answer two questions in the same question. So they say, did you find this um, challenging or stimulating? Well, what's, which is it? Is it challenging or stimulating? One people may, so one person may think they're answering stimulating. When I say keep it simple, I also mean keeping your language really, really simple because the already people will interpret the words and the terms that you use differently. So you can't know 
whether they they are actually meaning the same thing. So from the beginning of of when I was uh, starting to do these things, uh, I, I'm talking about 25 years ago. One of the questions I asked in questionnaires was about whether people felt happier uh, as a result. It just said it was a series of questions. Yes, no, not sure. Did you feel uh, happier was one of them? I don't remember the others. Some people were critical and said, well, what does that mean? People could mean anything. I think it had value because it doesn't matter what I think happier is. If somebody says they felt happier, that's good enough. They are making their judgment about their own feeling. And that's something I can respect. So there are words like that, which are simple and can be understood by people and maybe being interpreted differently by people, but it doesn't matter because the underlying question is they're all saying, I'm feeling happier. What that means to them may be different. Open-minded, as I said, I think this work is about learning. So um, that means you have to be looking for the things that aren't working, but also looking, trying to be open to the things that you're not expecting. So yes, you plan the evaluation beforehand. You think this is what I, I think will happen, but you're also watching for what may uh, have been entirely unexpected out of what's happening. And the last thing, um, and I was very, I can't remember who said, but it was one of the, the groups, maybe it was uh, um, Alexandra said she wanted, her work to be useful. And I think evaluation has to be useful. Um, unless it, it helps you, it's really not uh, worth doing. So uh, some simple evaluation methods. Uh, one is simply a matter of keeping records and keeping records consistently. Um, keeping records of the numbers of people who came to an activity, the numbers of activities that happened. Um, sometimes the easy way to do that is through a diary. Keeping photographs, but keeping photographs in an organized way and thinking, what am I photographing? Why am I photographing? There's a difference to photographing something to capture a moment and photographing something as a record that you can uh, say this is what happened. Um, and I put online as well, because now uh, uh, the, the various social media uh, platforms can be a way of keeping records and inviting other people to keep records. If young people are happy to, to post online, then you can invite them to do that. And then you have a, a record later. The value of keeping records is uh, in all kinds of ways, but I'll I'll say two things. One is you need to keep records at the time because you can't remember around this workshop. I won't be able to tell you next week because I'll be relying on my memory. I might be able to tell you next week if I've got taken a photograph and I forgot to, to um, make a note of how many people. So that's, the, that's one thing. Um, uh, and I've completely forgotten the other thing I was going to tell you about why that was useful. So we'll move on. Questionnaires. Some people like questionnaires, some people don't. I think they can be a useful tool, provided they're well designed, they're not too long, they're clear, and you use them sparingly. You use them only when you really need to use them. Um, I don't like questionnaires that, that show you a scale with a happy face and a sad face at the other end, and I've seen all kinds of terrible things like that, because you have to think, what are, what are the, the human reactions? You know, uh, who wants to, to, to tick the sad face, really? It's not a very natural thing to do. So you get, with those questionnaires, you get a lot on the happy side of the, of, of the thing. Um, but I think that if your questions are well framed, I've used questionnaires quite a lot, particularly with audiences, less with participants, but more to understand what audiences think. And audiences, if they, if your process is open, as I've said, and you're honest about it, you say to audiences, we really want to understand how you felt about what we did. My experience, they're happy to do that. They, you say to them, there are no right answers. We want to know what you really thought. Um, and crucially, 
questionnaires are helpful in quantifying responses. So it, we, I showed you earlier some, some um, uh, photographs from the National Theatre Wales film projections out of doors, and we did audience questionnaires after those. And they are quite telling because the numbers, they're not huge, but we had over 100 responses. So you start to get towards numbers which are indicative, where you can see a pattern emerging. The other uh, basic evaluation method, interviews and discussion, it's often called qualitative mes mes uh, research methods. These, the terms qualitative and quantitative are a bit misleading. Um, uh, you, you can quantify qualitative data. So you, I don't tend not to use those as such. I mean, questionnaires are often an, a way of quantifying qualitative data. If somebody is saying, yes, I feel happy, they are giving you a qualitative judgment, but the numbers of people who say that is quantifying that. So deeper understanding. So I'm currently working on the evaluation of the project, the Irish Opera Project, and I did some initial interviews with some of the participants last week and the week before. And they were long open-ended interviews, 45 minutes to an hour, where I'm asking somebody to tell me about themselves, I'm asking them to tell me about their, their background, so I have an idea of what kind of um, interest they had uh, and why they decided to become involved. I think I probably had about half a dozen questions, but mostly I will let them tell me what they want to tell me. I'm interested in learning it. It's another version of that active listening that we talked about before. And finally, and the, the crucial thing, it's important to think of reflection and judgment as a method. You don't just gather the data, you then have to think about it. You have to analyze it. You have to make judgments about it. You have to ask, what does this mean? What does it mean if people say they feel happier? And I think, because you know that I'm committed to uh, equality and, and participation and those kinds of principles, I think the best way to do that is to do it openly, together. Say to people, this is what I, I think we, we've learned from this. So that's what I told the, the interviewees in the Irish National Opera trial. I said to them, I'll, I'll show you what, what I've, uh, right, and you can tell me if you think I'm getting it wrong, yeah? Or if I've misunderstood something you've told me, you can challenge it. So that the knowledge that is emerging is also a, a co-created knowledge. It's not me deciding what you have learned or got from this workshop. It's us talking together and being able to influence each other's thinking. Um, and then when you've done evaluation, you need to report it. So first of all, think about the message. What's the story? What is the, what have you learned? Who might be interested and what, what are you trying to tell them? Think about the audience, who needs to hear it? They're, so I've already talked about the, the people who are involved need to hear it. It's their experience that you're writing about. So there's already an ethical, I think, an ethical responsibility to take that back to people. Otherwise, you're a kind of colonizer who's just going somewhere and extracting knowledge, uh, time, uh, trust from people. And then you go away and they never, never hear from you again. So, uh, but your audience may also be the funder other partners, other people who want to do the kind of work you do. Think about the meaning of it. Once you know what, what you have learned from the evaluation, what does it mean for you? What happens next? Does anything happen next? In my experience, far more evaluation reports are written than are read. They are submitted to funders who tick the box and release the last 10% of the grant because you've submitted the evaluation. The, the, the offices, the computers of, um, of funding bodies are bursting with unread 
It's not quite fair to say they're not read. They're skimmed through. What could really be useful is if the funders said, uh, perhaps even asked an outside evaluator to say, look at 100 evaluation reports from our, pro from our projects and tell us what the patterns are, what is consistent. Maybe we keep doing something wrong and our evaluation reports keep revealing that, but because we're not ever stepping back and looking at the whole picture, we don't see it. And therefore, what happens next is the same as it always has been. Um, I think that's probably the end of, of what I wanted to say. I would say, I'll finish with saying one last thing, which goes back to the beginning of, the, um, <clears throat> of what I was saying about the expectation. That some, uh, in my experience, some people in the cultural sector hope that evaluation will somehow be a bit like the Holy Grail. It will just finish all the arguments about whether are we convinced. I don't think convincing anything of anyone, anyone of anything. It's not what it's for. It's there for learning, for discussion, for reflection, for improving practice. If you want to convince people of things, there are better tools. I would say, um, as somebody who's written a lot of reports and some of which have been influential and others not, I don't think reports persuade politicians. So all the rhetoric about evidence-based policy is just that, it's rhetoric. It's the idea that people want to think that they're rational. In my experience, the, the, the one time that I know that, that my work contributed to a change in government policy, um, it only did that because government already wanted to, to change in the way. So what the report did was in effect, give it a justification for doing what it had already decided to do. So if you like, it was policy-based evidence rather than evidence-based policy. It, it answered those questions. Having said that, I want to say a word about how minds do get changed, because I think this is important for people who work in the arts. If you ask yourself when you last changed your mind about something important, I would suggest that it's, it was not data, it wasn't graphs, it wasn't uh, figures or reports. It was an experience. That's what changes us. You can see how quickly the world is changing now when suddenly we have had the, the traumatic experience of finding ourselves in a war. Everything that, that was unthinkable 10 days ago is now um, uh, changed. The same happened with the pandemic. Things that were unthinkable, the idea that we would all suddenly be confined to our homes was unimaginable. It was like science fiction before it happened. So experiences change us. And the other thing that I think ch changes us more than research report and is very underestimated is argument. When we can explain why doing theater with these young people might have a chance of helping them get back into school, when we have a clear understanding of what the reasoning behind that could be, then people start to pay more attention to us. So the good thing about that is that the arts are all about experiences. So if you want to persuade people that your work is good, bring them to see what you do. Introduce them to people who can talk about it. To help get the, the local politician to come and meet the young people in the, in the drama uh, workshop you're doing and have them say why it's helped them. That will be far more effective.